uh, which brings us down to um, this evening. And uh, we've been reading Clint's name out for quite a while there, the topic tonight, of course, is radio astronomy. And uh, Clint Jeffries, our presenter, VK3 CSJ. And Clint's the current sector director of the radio astronomy section of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. That's a mouthful, Clint. <laughs> and uh, he'll be addressing the past, present, and future aspects of the RAS. And Clint's presentation this evening will detail what the radio astronomy section has been doing over the past 15 years that he's been involved with. And uh, just some details there. The Society's based in Melbourne and attracts people with a wide range of astronomical interests. Originally founded in 1922, it was the largest such organisation in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, this year celebrates its 90th anniversary. And uh, it also wants it made known that membership is open to anybody who's got an interest in astronomy. You don't have to be all that talented, but just an interest will uh, we'll, uh, get you through the door. Um, all right. Firstly, I've got quite a few slides to show, so I'm going to try and get through it very, very quickly. Um, but before I carry on, I, I wasn't too sure how many people were going to be here tonight, so I burned some DVDs pretty much of this presentation, plus a whole lot of stuff. In fact, all my radio astronomy files and my hard drive, I pretty much just simply dumped on this DVD disc. So you're welcome to take one, they're free, but there's only 20 of them. So <laughs> if you're really after tonight, if you're really interested, just take it and uh, I'll burn, be happy to burn some more for sure. Not a problem. We don't mind if we copy them if there's a shortage. Yeah, look, yeah. Not, not a hassle at all. Okay, well, look, thanks very much for uh, showing up tonight, guys. It really is a good turnout. Don't leave these on. Um, Whew, where do we start? Uh, I'm the section director of the radio astronomy section of uh, ASV. Have been now for about the last four years, and uh, but have been overall involved with ASV for about 15, 16 years. Um, so we're going to cover a little bit of the past, going back a little bit to my childhood actually. But I'm just going to skim over that fairly quickly. But before I get into the, the crux of what we're basically doing, so yeah, my name is Clint Jeffrey. And uh, just pretty much what I've just said. <laughs> um, that's the uh, picture of the old shack at uh, Dandenong. I've now moved location to Narry Warren South, so I'm getting things slowly together. And uh, so basically, I've always been interested in radio astronomy. Um, but before we go into that, let's digress a little bit back to the, to, uh, the past. And uh, I don't know if anybody actually remembers um, uh, back in the 60s, uh, the Channel 9 used to televise uh, a university, Sydney University lectures early on Channel, Channel 9 early in the morning. And that's, where, that's my introduction to Carl Sagan uh, and Professor Frank Drake. Although I didn't really know, know them personally in any way or anything like that, but it was just the way they came across the TV sounded very, very interesting. And I thought, what is it they're really on about? Carl was talking about the cosmos, about stars, about galaxies in the universe whereas Frank Drake was talking about the radio, radio science and all that side of it. And I thought the, the two kind of connected, but I, and of course they were talking about very technical stuff over my head, but it was still very, very fascinating stuff. And I've, I, I remember watching that stuff a long time ago. Um, all right. So basically that little seed was planted and I was about 10 years old, I guess, around about that time. Things like uh, this, this How and Why book, which I just still happen to have in my collection, um, I don't know whether you guys ever saw anything like that, the old Helen White books, but that, I walked around with that pretty much most of my teenage life, or even before I was a teenager, and that, that inspired me a lot into getting into electronics and, and, uh, and radio. And it was these, these pictures that are in the book here, these two towers and uh, all the sort of thing that really spurred me on, the whole concept of radio waves emanating from a tower source and puddles in a, uh, representing waves in the pond really got to me. I think, what is all this? What does it all mean? Um, so it's just developed a, a dream. And I think for most ham radio operators, we've all had that beginning somewhere. And I think that's the bug. When we talk about ham radio and having an interest in radio and the bug, that bug, it's this sort of thing uh, is where it all starts from. And unfortunately, these days, because of mobile phones and the internet, a lot of kids don't dream this stuff. So it's just unfortunate how, it's, uh, how we're losing it. Uh, next one. Uh, so again, out of the same book, I think it is. These images of Maconi and his uh, his wireless and uh, just, you know looking through the window of a tower and all that. I've almost got a similar sort of thing right now in my own uh, new place where I'm living. I'm in a barn. 
and the upstairs window as I look out from my shack, I can now see the new Nelly Tower out. So I'm, I'm making connections here. <laughs> Although, mind you, uh, it doesn't want to go back by just, um, because I'm hitting the wrong button. That's it. Mind you, the Morse code side of it's long gone. Um, <laughs> Uh, and of course, images like this too of a simple transmitter wasn't really that simple. I mean, how amazing it is to understand the principles of electricity and electromotive force. <coughs> In another book I had, um, images like this of radio waves going off and bouncing off the ionosphere, multi-hop um, propagation. It was all invisible, but it was a real thing. It actually happened. And, and again, that inspired my, my thinking. Uh, about uh, what is it that disappears or emanates from a copper wire in the air and bounces off this other invisible layer around the Earth. I mean, really, really fascinated me. This little radar thing with a pulse going out to a distant star, gee, that just blew me away. What was all that about? <laughs> so essentially, it didn't take me long before I, I, I understood what ham radio was all about. Uh, I got my license when I was 16 years old, novice license, of course. I had that for about 10 years. Um, built my first 30 watt transmitter and pretty much from all there uh, one of the highlights was talking to Andy on the, the Mia space station and, uh, and of course just the basic interest in electronics and radio has kept me employed for, for over 30 years. Um, I mean the first job I had was 11 years at NEC. The guy who interviewed me there was a ham radio operator and he says, I said to him, I've just got my novice. And he says, oh, you're in. You start next Tuesday? No worries. So <laughs> I thought, cool, OK. <laughs> um, so it's pretty much how it's been ever since. <clears throat> and of course, there's good old Andy uh, on the old, old mirror that's now defunct. It's burnt up many years ago. And of course, Andy and I were, were mates. We uh, caught up with each other and just thought we'd get, have a cup of coffee with together. So there is a, that's not Photoshop, that's feeding him. <laughs> And that's a QSL card too that uh, you get if you worked uh, Andy on when he was had that six month period on on the Mir space station. Was your card for packet or for phone? Did it say on it? Uh, phone. phone. It was phone. Because normally they come out same packet. Yeah, I, I did try to send a t message for the packet system, but not much came from that, I'm afraid. Uh, and of course, as we know, there are Hollywood movies that include ham radio, um, things like a phenomenon and frequency. Uh, my favourite contact and Independence Day, they all include ham radio, the, the whole idea, although Hollywood's version of ham radio is a bit dubious, but anyway, it still comes across. But anyway, this, this, all these sorts of things inspired me, and um, I think for a period during the 80s, uh, uh, I occasionally saw articles on radio astronomy in AR magazine and something like that, and I, I sent a message out over the packet system, it, does anybody know anything about radio astronomy, who can I contact? And uh, lo and behold, somebody local around this area actually uh, got in contact with me again through the packet system and said, yes, ASV has radio astronomy section. Come across, I'll take you across and show you to Lockie Creswell, who was the section director at the time. And I haven't, I mean, I've, I've been there ever since. It's just, it's just amazing how I've just about attended every meeting in these last 16 years. Um, but it was around about 1993 that I came across to, uh, to ASV and uh, introduced it to everybody. And fortunately, there was this event was occurring, uh, Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 impacting with Jupiter. And we had this amazing idea, why not set up some receivers around the place and see if we can actually detect uh, these collisions, these impacts, see if there was any possible way of collecting the data. data. So we made, made a mad rush in setting up uh, various, oops, wrong way, various, uh, oh, here you go, this, is, this you know, if, if this works, there we go. Some little gift animated here of uh, the impacts of, uh, of Schumacher Levy with Jupiter. I think we all remember the, the images from Jupiter where we saw the big marks on, uh, uh, on the, the, in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter at the time. I remember I had it as a screensaver for a while. So there's, there's the actual... Um, because these are the actual uh, uh, fragments as they broke up due to gravitational forces. Uh, they all lit up like little uh, Christmas trees, and uh, they all were designated fragment A, B, C, that sort of thing. And uh, they all impacted uh, eventually with Jupiter. And that's the, an infrared shot there showing you as they actually impacted in the afterglow. And of course here is one of these uh, eruptions or Im impacts superimposed on Earth to scale. To give you an idea, if we had have had similar impact on Earth, then we, there would have been not much left of Earth, I'm afraid. 
maybe uh, maybe America would have survived. But, <laughs> but <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> Um, okay, so we, we went crazy to set up four, at least four stations to see if we had a chance of detecting. Um, there was an installation in Mount Burnett that was uh, the observatory up here that Monash University had organised. Uh, Tuck Choi, VK3CCA, I think his call sign is, um, and a few other fellows set up a, a, a little observatory. There's a little res a reserve up, um, water reservoir up there, and they built a folded dipole across the water lake tack as a reflector and uh, they actually had the was system running. Was turnstile antenna? And, uh, yeah, was it? Turnstile antenna. Oh, okay. Oh, yep, yep, yep. All right. And they had that running for about three months prior to the impact to try and get a baseline. And uh, so they, they had all this data. Uh, oh, actually, I won't go there yet. But uh, <laughs> it was a working receiver system going. Uh, one up at Yay. One at Dandenong, which happened to be my, my, uh, in my radio shack. And of course, Doug MacArthur, VK3UM, was, was brought in at, almost at the last moment to see whether he could actually detect anything at 400 megs. Surprisingly enough, he did. And uh, that's what Doug recorded. I mean, it looks like a squiggly line, but he, he was able to correlate the, these pulses at 400 megs um, with Fragment K, the times that we had that, that NASA published that, for impacts. And that's pretty much what he he, he was able to record uh, at 400 megs, which is pretty, pretty darn good. Um, okay, well, before I go there, and of course this is the chart recordings that we did at the time. I actually managed to find these just before I came here tonight. But that, that just goes to show the sort of thing that I was doing in the Radio Shack at home. That's from an, an old chart recorder, Kent chart recorder, which weighs a ton, it's a real boat anchor. I went through miles of, of paper just doing this, but the thrill of actually having a chart recorder running and in, in a darkened room, because you had everything turned off to minimise any interference to your receiver, and here you are, you know, every five minutes you're listening to WWV and you're plotting the time against the, the chart, and around about here somewhere, we managed to correlate that uh, the impact, the fragment, um, uh, G, fragment G impact was, was recorded on there. I know it looks like a squiggle line, but we were able to correlate with other chart recordings from other receivers. And uh, we figured that having actual proof, that, or at least a correlation, was a really, really big buzz, really significant thing. And at, at the club room um, at ASV, we had these charts just laid out across the table as we analysed and studied, and it was really quite, a, quite an amazing time. Anyway, that, that sort of spawned us all on to doing other things. We had w word of, uh, of a, a couple of dish antennas, the Colomede, I think that's how you pronounce it, Colomede uh, down the peninsula, an old R&D Telstra built place. And uh, they had these dishes that were being literally cut up for scrap within a few days and we were given word about it and uh, we were told, pick them up or they'll go and get scrapped. So we, <laughs> so, um, we had with this, this 4.6 metre dish here this is us picking it up from, from the property. That's, that's me in the little hat there. And uh, the dish on the back of the truck. Uh, this is the ultimate location where it's been set up at Eric Dodge's property up at Officer. Uh, this here, we've uh, given a coat of paint and, uh, and uh, the um, struts on the back for mounting it to, uh, to our support. Uh, here we are with uh, two, two slide rings. One's fixed, concreted in the ground. The other one slides on top, kind of break, braced together so they don't go falling over. Um, Eric Dodge designed the, the support system and uh, we had great plans for this dish. Um, Dunn's Hill is just over there so our, our takeoff from the top of this hill at Beaconsfeld or Officer was good. We had a lot of potential up to that location and I think we mucked around with this dish for uh, uh, probably for about five or six years doing various things but lack of funds was an issue uh, trying to do anything with it. Um, that's um, that's a, a hydrogen line receiver for monitoring or detection of neutral hydrogen in the universe at 1.4 gigs. Uh, we were also at the time trying to, to also basically get a, 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 a looking at the sun, getting sun noise and trying to plot the performance of the dish as well. Um, but as you can see in that picture here, we, our, um, our method of stabilizing the dish with two counterweights just there 
was a bit dodgy. Any, <laughs> any, any gust of wind or anything like that would suddenly move this structure quite significantly. So we had a, 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 an ongoing situation of trying to get this dish steerable, but unfortunately the funds for, for motors and gearboxes was a bit of an issue for us. Um, there's another working bee. We're, we're mucking around with the sub uh, reflector. Uh, it was a Gregorian type feed structure. And uh, we, we even put silver aluminium on the surface of the dish to try and reflect light to, to, to use light. It was just an experiment to determine the focal point of the dish using just simply reflecting light off it. Um, but of course, all the calculations told us where the focal point was anyway. So <laughs> we were doing all the, the right things, but we we're just having a muck around and uh, uh, we did some very, very, very good things in that, that time. Anyway, that's like six years of mucking around. <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden, we, I remember reading an article about Jupiter. Jupiter is a very active planet, and uh, it actually produces emissions um, at around 20 megahertz. That's actually very broad band, but um, Australian radio astronomers here uh, were the first to actually detect the, the pulses or the emissions from Jupiter, decometric emission, but they didn't really see too much into it at the time because they were focused on other things with, uh, with the CSIRO and studies of, of, uh, of uh, radio astronomy. And it wasn't until uh, Bernard Burke and Kenneth Franklin, um, a couple of Americans, decided to follow up on what the Australians had uh, uh, tripped across and uh, discovered that, uh, hey, Jupiter's worth uh, studying and having a look at. This is a, a little hot spot <coughs> uh, at, the, at the northern regions of, of Jupiter. It's uh, intense X-ray sources that do emit RF energy, um, which can be detected at shortwave frequencies. It's actually a very, very impressive uh, system. I mean, even to this day, scientists don't fully understand what's, uh, what's happening, what the mechanisms are going on, although they, they say that it's a synchrotron uh, emission. Um, there's a little graphic coming up that sort of illustrates that. But uh, it does produce some very interesting sounds which can be detected at 20 megahertz. And um, uh, here we're seeing S bursts, what, what S bursts would look like. They're short bursts uh, and long bursts which sound like the, the waves crashing on a beach shore. Um, uh, thank you, sir. So when I found out about uh, um, this, these interesting uh, storms, Jupiter storm activity, this is one, one particular model or picture that shows basically what's happening. There's this huge cone of radiation uh, that uh, is, is emanating from Jupiter practically all the time, but it's only when Jup Earth, Earth and, and Jupiter lines up do we actually get the chance of actually being able to detect these emissions. And it is predictable. There is a program that you can download off the internet that actually will uh, predict when these events occur. Uh, it's a two hour window. You sit there with your chart recorder going with a chance of possibly recording um, these signals. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, projector kind of washes it out a bit, but uh, that just illustrates that the radiation is, is varied from 40 megs to 20 megs. It's very latitude orientated. Um, it, it <laughs> It, I mean, Jupiter produces a very intense magnetic field, and because the moon Io is its first moon very close to, to Jupiter, here it's illustrating Io the moon, um, this vortex of, of energy that, that emanates from Jupiter just produces this synchrotron radiation, which produces an RF emission, and uh, it's, it's very easy to detect it. Um, all you need to really set up is just a, a dipole a antenna. We, we used a phased array up at, uh, at Heathcote, and uh, uh, it's quite possible to detect this stuff. I've got some sound files of it. This is one graphic that illustrates what's going on um, in the intense uh, magnetic regions of uh, Jupiter. There's another one in a minute that kind of gives you a bit of an idea. So there's the magnetic field. Um, the charges spiral around at such a great rate that radio waves are emitted as a result. So what they call synchrotron radiation. And uh, again, with this pr prediction program, you can actually uh, determine when to, is the best time to, to listen to, to uh, the storm, Jupiter storm activity. So we, had a, we went out of our way to actually set up several receivers around the place to, to be able to receive these storms. So if you have one receiving station, you don't know whether you're picking up some local noise or something coming in from, from Jupiter.
All right, so next, next, next. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, Mel Wilkinson, a local boy, uh, decided to actually uh, write an article about how to receive decimetric commissions and you can actually download this article from our website. Um, I, actually it's not included in the disc that, I, that I've uh, been busily burning up these last uh, uh, couple of hours but um, uh, there's a lot of information just in these articles, it's about five or six pages long and it gives you a bit of a rundown of what's, uh, what's happening in a, in a way of actually being able to detect these emissions from Jupiter. Uh, here's a, c a few models that uh, give you an idea of uh, also what's been suggested is, is going on. Um, uh, again, it's, it's very frequency uh, dependent in, depending on the latitude of, uh, of the upper part of Jupiter there. Um, but again, like I say, scientists are still don't fully understand the mechanism involved with, uh, with what's going on. And the sound files, let's hope this works. This is what short bursts sound like. That's, that's actually just me sitting here with a couple of wires going. <laughs> but what, what's actually happening is that they're short bursts, but they're, they're traveling from 40 megahertz downwards at megahertz per second rate and going through your IF of your receiver so quickly that all you hear is this little, little bursts of noise passing the, the, the bandwidth of your receiver. The, uh, the other one is long bursts. Which again is the same thing, but it's a, it's a different, just a slightly different phenomenon with, with a completely different sound character. But it's, again, it's, it's, it starts at high frequency, 40 megahertz, and one is it, it drifts down towards the low end of the band, like 15 megahertz, and then pe uh, peters out. Uh, this one's interesting. What, what you're actually hearing there though is pretty much the same thing you've just heard, long bursts and short bursts, but record at a really high speed, 30 inches a second type rate, and then slow down to the range that actually hear it. And of course the other thing that Jupiter, when, when Jupiter is below the horizon, like it is at the moment, and it's not usable because it's up during the day, you can listen to solar flares that are occurring, and this is what a, a classic solar flare sounds like. I think it's working. There we are. Need a bit of volume on that. Let's So, <clears throat> with, uh, with, with, with us reaching the solar maximum um, in, in the next 12 months or so, the sun has been particularly active of late, and uh, I've been have actually monitoring our receiver through the uh, website, and uh, there's been quite a few flares recorded. Um, as part of the, the, uh, the, the Jupiter project, NASA actually sponsors uh, a website and interest in, uh, in particularly in schools and universities and setting up a, a Jupiter receiver which, which they call Radio Joe and uh, they actually sell the kits which is this little device here um, it's a um, direct conversion receiver that's a kit that's about 180 odd dollars or so and I, I purchased about four of them and we've got three in use at the moment and this is this is the fourth one which I tend to uh, um, We'll be using as an interferometer, where I've got two, two, two antennas set up together and connected to the one receiver to do some very interesting things that way. So that's what we're using, just that simple receiver to, to be able to detect Jupiter emission and solar flare activity. 
Um, and of course, uh, not too long ago, Autronics, or actually Silicon Chip, produced this little receiver as well that you could build up for a kit. They called it the Jupiter receiver, I think. Um, and that, that works quite well too. Um, so um, that's the website still active, still going strong, and, and uh, lots of information can be gleaned from that particular website. Um, this is uh, where our three stations are located at the moment. Um, Heathkit up there at uh, just uh, um, the Leon Mao Radio Observatory uh, is the ASV's dark sky site. Um, so we travel two hours from Melbourne uh, to, to go up there to escape the light from the city uh, for the optical astronomers. Um, but from a RF point of view, it's actually not a bad little location. It's fairly quiet. And uh, so we have an observatory there, uh, ACRO at Arthur's Creek and Eric Dodge's reserve, uh, observatory at, uh, at, uh, at an officer. And uh, having those stations separated the way they are, if there's any local noise, then you can be sure that the, the station elsewhere is not seeing it. But if they all see a solar flare at the same time, then we know for sure that the sun's just burped. Uh, if, um, uh, the same thing for, uh, uh, for Jupiter emissions as well. We all should see the same thing. It's all locked into the internet time. And so we're, we, we've got a fairly good accuracy with our, our, our measurements. There's the, uh, one of the antennas up at uh, the, uh, um, Eric Dodge's observatory. Uh, it's just a, a couple of dipoles phased together, um, about 10 feet above the ground. So we've got a major lobe about 60, uh, at about 60 degrees looking at the sky. <coughs> um, this is our own phased array up at uh, Hithcote. Um, I've used 20 foot poles, 6 metre length of poles, so that I can actually change the radiation angle by physically lifting the antenna above the, the, uh, the surface of the, of the ground. Um, and this is a, an image created by CSIRO of Jupiter, so you can actually see these um, interesting hot spots that, that uh, occur um, at certain times in relation to Earth. That's that ray that you saw in that, that GIF animated image that we, we had, I showed before. So this, this represents uh, what we call, affectionately called storm, Jupiter storm activity. Um, now this is interesting. This, this is a, um, uh, an observatory over in Mexico which runs uh, um, uh, a, a setup of about, probably about 50 or 60 antennas, log, log periodic type antennas, just, just off the ground. Uh, taking up about an acre of land, and they, they look at the sky in real time. So what we're seeing here is is Jupiter emitting every now and then. It just it just emits that particular RF radiation that that, that I'm talking about, and um, the projector's a bit hard hard to see, but that's Cassiopeia there in Cygnus A being emitted. This is around uh, 25 megs. Um, I think you've got the galactic coming up on the on the horizon here, but um, Jupiter's not doing much right now. But there it is. There's there's suddenly there's a there's one of those em uh, Jupiter emissions that I've been talking about, and uh, this is really quite an amazing uh, uh, arrangement to have a, a system going in real time where you can actually see the sky in in RF from an RF point of view. I mean, if our eyes were able to to see radio signals in RF, they'd be as big as wagon wheels. Um, to, to be able to see that. So, <laughs> so uh, we're hoping to do something similar um, using perhaps satellite dishes, whole, an array of satellite dishes all focused up at the sky or something similar anyway. And we're kind of aiming at uh, doing something very similar uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, can I go to the next slide? There we go. So here, here is an interesting correlation. This is... Um, this is a Jupiter storm chart. Uh, it was probably an IO, what they call an IOA uh, emission. And we have a, an observatory over in Anchorage, uh, a Whitlam Reeve, who's an engineer who's also got uh, a system running in his, his property. So we, we were doing observations at the same time. And we can see that he, he actually lined up the chart. So t from a time point of view, that's all in exact time reference. So it's just interesting how Arthur's Creek Observatory didn't really see, it, it did see something, but not, not entirely the same amplitude as what, uh, what Witt saw over in Anchorage and what we saw over here in Officer. But what Arthur's Creek did detect was some, 
signature or some signal here, whereas on the other chart it's just just the slightest peak. So it's it's it is interesting how the the phase of the the signal coming in can change, just like it would be with a ham radio signal, for instance. But having these these charts uh, going um, uh, enables us to uh, to be able to record these events. We've we've got rid of the old uh, paper technique. This is now uh, computer computer based, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, and of course, uh, here's a, a, an idea of what our galaxy looks like. This is approximately where our sun would be. We're about 26,000 light years from the centre of our of our galaxy, and, and there's actually a, a picture that looks to, into the heart of our galaxy um, that's just come through in the last few months or so. Um, <laughs> uh, what we're seeing here is is the peak of the galaxy going through the beam of the, our antennas. So not only can, can the radio Jove receiver detect Jupiter storm activity or solar flares, but on a 24-hour basis the center of the galaxy goes through the beam of the antenna and it is quite possible to see uh, the, the black hole in the, so the center of our galaxy going through the beam. This is actually a high energy particle or, or pulses being detected there as well, we, we believe emanating from the black hole. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, you can imagine that area there amplified in this region here. Um, there's a standard what a solar flare looks like. So that solar burst that you heard just a moment ago is what it looks like graphically. It's just a very quiet noise floor and all of a sudden pshhh, really very loud and then just a slow decay and maybe just a few little little bursts uh, from the sun. So that's the standard, standard solar flare, um, what it looks like. And something like that can dramatically affect radio communications on, on our shortwave bands as well. Uh, this is uh, looking over about five days. With the chart, electronic chart program you can append the files together so that every 24 hour period of, of recording you can put them together. And this is, this is basically what it looks like. This is what Charles Carl Jansky uh, discovered back in 1933, uh, I think it was, 1926 maybe. I remember about that time when he was told to investigate why there was static and noise being picked up on the, over the telephone lines and he found that the noise was coming from up there and not somewhere local and uh, with his, his antenna system which was he, he made actually rotatable um, he did determine that the noise was coming in from, from the, the, uh, from the uh, universe and um, this is pretty much what he was able to record as well. So uh, this, this bit, all these noisy bits in the middle here is just daytime with the, the sun up and lots of other man-made noise as well. But uh, during the night time, if Sagittarius A, when you look at Sagittarius, you're looking towards the centre of our galaxy. And so this, is, this basically represents the centre of our galaxy going through the beam every night. So uh, from there, we... Um, uh, we realised that uh, to have a, a radio receiver running in suburbia wasn't a good thing because local noise is a bit of a problem, man-made noise and computers and crap. So we actually utilised our dark sky site up at Heathcote. We got a shipping container and uh, we're actually using the shipping container now to actually house a lot of our experiments that we're uh, getting up and running. We've only just recently painted it to a, a white colour to try and minimise the, uh, the heat aspect. Um, we, we're actually going to put a roof over it very soon, but um, the cut, giving it a couple of coats of white paint actually reduced the temperature uh, by about three or four degrees, um, which was interesting. This is uh, just mucking around with a bit more. We've actually lined the inside of the, the um, container now with a wall, make it nice. The, the, that's just setting up the Jove antennas, radio Jove antennas. Um, there's the Jove receiver and a noise calibrating device. That's the weather station we've got up and running as well. It's one of the first things I had up and running was the weather station. Uh, and of course, the, one of the projects we've been working on for the last six months is turning the inside of the container into an RF screen room environment, uh, which has taken a bit of time to do, but this is, this is all our little effort to create a, an RF screen room environment inside the container to try and minimise uh, not only if, if anything produces interference from inside the container to minimise getting into our antennas and conversely anything on the outside getting in and upsetting our receivers on the inside as well. We're, here we are with the, with the door um, side of it. I've purchased some finger stocks so that we can get a good electrical connection as the door closes to try and minimise, um, to create that RF lock so to speak. And uh, that's with the tin sheeting on the door 
and uh, we're almost complete. We're just, the last thing we've got to do right now is just put a, a locking handle to apply equal pressure to our screen door and that will have it almost complete. So with all that finally done, with the weather station going, a lightning detector up and running, I, I wanted these things I could get, it, get going really easy. Uh, the next thing was to try and get this all visible on the internet because there's no actual um, way of connecting up there through the internet other than through a satellite feed. We thought about using uh, uh, ADSL but we're 12 kilometres away from the nearest uh, exchange. The wireless broadband was going to be a bit expensive so we, we managed to organise for a satellite feed. And that's it there. That's the satellite system with a little IP star modem that runs 24-7. That modem there is self-booting so if we lose power um, it just automatically starts up. We don't have to worry about it. It's a really, really great little invention, that one. Uh, that's the basic configuration. Uh, satellite, remote modem configuration. We can actually have a, a phone on it if we want to, but we haven't gone that far. We're, all we're doing is uploading data. We're not really downloading much data at all. That's the website at the moment. Um, there's a few extra tabs added uh, from when I put this up on, the, on, on this presentation, but basically that's, that's what our web page looks like. So we've got, um, we've got the weather lightning detector, our Jovian receiver, the output of our Jovian receiver is displayed as an FTP image, the VLF receiver, magnetometer, cosmic ray receiver, 21 centimetre receiver, solar media and, and a little gallery. Although I've squeezed in here a seismometer, I've just recently had a little seismometer uh, uh, put together and uh, it's doing great things. There's our weather station, simple little GIF images. I figured if I could get this up and running quick, the, the optical side of the astronomers at ASV could make advantage of actually discovering what's going on up there weather-wise, what the climate is like. Um, so I figured this was one of the first things I could get up and running really quick and easy. Three day, a week, a chart that looks back at history over, over a week of uh, how the, the weather's appearing. Um, that's our lightning detector. Um, by clicking on like full 60 minutes window and then clicking run you can actually see this animated the lightning activity generate and move as the, the front moves across through Victoria that's if it is lightning around so it's rather interesting to have this uh, up and running now um, this is our FTP charts this is what's the output of the receiver we're, here we're looking at about a uh, at the moment we're looking at about a 10 minute window, actually I think it might be 15, 10 or 15 minute window. This one is the accumulated uh, span over 24 hours. Um, this is a quiet time up at uh, Heathkit. This is a noisy time. So what I'm saying is when there's nobody up at, at our dark sky side um, that's running go to telescopes and computers and stuff like that, we get a nice quiet observation during the night. But this, this is a result of people activity up there. Like we have every, uh, annually we have a star barbecue up at ASV. And so you have up to about 200, 300 people wandering around with their computers and go to telescopes. And this can actually produce quite a bit of significant noise, which can affect us. So that's just the, this is actually the Saturday, and this is the, no, sorry, this is the Saturday, and this is the following Sunday. So it just goes to show how interference can be a, a real hassle for all of us. Um, on the same site, Jovian receiver site, this is a bit of a blurb about what's going on, but um, if you want to download the program that we use to record uh, 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 the electronic charting program, that link there gives you, uh, it takes you straight to the website where you can download Radio Skypipe. Um, if you wanted to listen to our audio stream directly from the receiver, um, click on uh, online and you'll be able to eventually, it might take you a few seconds, but you can actually connect directly to the audio output of the receiver. Uh, a link to the uh, NASA Radio Joe project. And that, that's, that article I was talking about, um, Project for Detecting Radio Emissions from Jupiter by Mel Wilkinson, that's the link that'll take you to those, that uh, five or six page article. Um, we actually also um, archive our charts. Um, bit messy at the moment, but there is a way of being able to look back at uh, previous charts as well. Uh, this is the Skypipe program. This is the actual website, but you can see that there's many windows that they can be opened up for various functions that the program can do. For 30 bucks, I mean, for 30 bucks gives you a registration key. If you're a member of ASV, I can give you one for free. <laughs> but um, uh, I mean, even without the registration key, this program can still do some pretty marvelous things on its own. Um, it's got its own internal FTP managing program, so you can FTP the images up to your website. Um, but it's an amazing little program and what it can do. Um, there's another shot of the, the, the same 
full screen size of the charting program. You can change the colors and all this. There's that prediction program I was talking about that all these colored squares uh, are potential emissions from Jupiter that can be predicted uh, using this program. The program's actually got a, a range of other things too that can plot the radiation pattern of the antenna that, that you've got at, uh, at different, different phasing and different angles above the ground. Um, and what we're showing here is, uh, is this is these two events here. There's a, what they call an IOB and an IO, uh, a, a non-IOB event occurring around about this time. And you can see that in GMT, it's about 20 to 21 that, that there should have been a, an event occurring. And sure enough, I recorded an event around 20 to 21 time. So um, it was pretty amazing just to, to, I was just sitting at the kitchen table, the laptop on the kitchen table connected to the internet. And I was able to log in to, to the, uh, the receiver up at Heathkit and detect this burst in the comfort of your lounge room. Um, <laughs> I just, I still think that's amazing stuff. With the same program, you can actually divide the screen up into three, three separate charts. You can open up a, another client view and another client view. And so here we're looking at Heathkit, at Acro, at, at Hurstbridge, or Arthur's Creek, and at EDRO at the same time. Now there wasn't any particular event occurring at that, that time that, that I, I could recall, but you could see how the, the noise in, at each site is a little bit different. And, but if there had been a solar flare or a Jupiter emission, both, all three sites would have detected it at the same time. And uh, you can actually calibrate the, the chart in, uh, in terms of Kelvin uh, using this little, um, this little noise converter device, which is a pretty handy device. It's, uh, it's, it's stepped up to its six different levels. Um, and with that in line, it's got a little switch there. You can switch it so the noise source is switched in, switch it out so it switches the antenna through. And that steps it through uh, uh, six different levels of calibration, calibrated in, in noise. Uh, in Kelvin, the temperature, um, 35.5K, 71K, 142K, 284K, and just goes up to over mega K, <laughs> uh, which represent a very strong X-ray flare from, from the sun. So with something like that, you can then quantify your measurements that you take on the, on the chart recording. Next, uh, the VLF receiver. Uh, with VLF, you can do quite a lot of things. That's the loop antenna that we're currently in the process of designing, 1.2 metre loop. Um, not quite finished yet. Uh, we also want to monitor below 10 kilohertz for, for atmospheric effects. Um, not sure how well these sounds will come across, but uh, this is what you can hear below 10 kilohertz, what they call spherics, short for atmospherics and distant lightning strikes. I've got, I've got this very, very low frequency, 10 kilohertz receiver, and I plan to get that set up with the loop and have the audio running 24-7 through to our website so you can just instantly log into it and have a listen to what's going on. Um, then you've got these whistlers. Where's my mouse? There it is. Let's play that again. So there, that's actually distant strikes, dis, dis, very, very distant lightning strikes being caught in the, the magnetic field of the Earth and whisking along, giving this almost this Doppler effect that's uh, occurring. And then little tweaks. It's a very short sound file, that. But again, very, they're just very, very distant lightning strikes. It might not be radio astronomy ex, ex, as such, but at least... Oh. There. But at least it's it's interesting stuff. I, I think all that sort of thing is fascinating that we can have running up at our observatory, radio observatory up at Heathkit. One of the things we're also going to be doing is monitoring Northwest Cape at 19.8 uh, kilohertz uh, for any SID uh, uh, or sudden irosmic disturbance again caused by solar flare activity. Um, uh, Northwest Cape is still fortunately running. Uh, it's about 3,000 odd kilometres away, and um, we should be able to see when a solar flare. Uh, it, it hits the Earth's atmosphere and, and ionizes it. We should be able to, to detect, um, well, there's a, there's a graphic that sort of indicates what's going on with the long wave frequency, what layers of the ionosphere are affected at day and night. Um, again, the, way, the Earth's atmosphere acts like a wave guide at these frequencies. And uh, uh, when, when a solar flare hits the upper atmosphere, it's just amazing that the, uh, the things that do occur. Um, 
That's a, this is a, a, a one recording that is around about, well actually it's monitoring quite a, 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 probably about between 10 kilohertz and 30 kilohertz. And uh, this is uh, what a solar flare looks like at long wave frequencies. It's just a, like a shark fin, it's just, there it is. And it can affect uh, the uh, characteristics of the band too for a short while until things get uh, back to normal. Um, we have a magnetometer. Magnetometers again the same thing. Solar flares can affect uh, Earth's uh, geomagnetism. Uh, we're using a, a SAM unit, a sam simple aurora monitor, um, put together by Whit Reeve up there at As Alaska. Um, this is the same sort of thing that occurs uh, when a solar flare is, uh, affects our Earth's magnetic field. You can actually measure the, the changes in the uh, uh, magnetic field. Uh, as a result of the solar flare. With the magnetometer is about 90% complete. I've just got to put the sensors, uh, connect the sensors up and we should be able to output the data from the magnetometer to, uh, uh, to the internet as well. Uh, and of course this is the sort of thing that can happen with a solar flare. Um, you can have uh, problems with uh, satellites and with aircraft, HF radio wave disturbances. Uh, and of course up in Canada you can get the same thing with over, on, over, over uh, land power lines also affected by uh, very very intense uh, lightning. So it's it's solar flare. So it's very interesting to be able to monitor this stuff um, uh, and uh, output to a to a, a website. The cosmic ray receiver. What was that current? <coughs> the bottom left hand in the pipeline. Oh, they're just saying that some of these uh, solar events can be so intense that the cu uh, currents and voltages can be induced into over land uh, pipelines as well which yeah, could can cause can cause yeah, yeah, yeah which right. can cause issues yeah. um, I purchased a little cosmic ray receiving device um, uh, again here that this particles are coming in from the universe all the time they're going through us right now as we speak um, oh there we are just then um, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> as they go through the atmosphere they break up into all these other sub particles and the cosmic ray receiver, which is this one here, uh, is quite capable of de detecting alpha and beta gamma particles. Um, with the two detectors here running together uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a dual com combination, it's possible to actually detect cosmic rays if both sensors get activated at the same time. That's the idea behind that. Um, and the the output of this device, again, and I mean, one of the reasons why I like this is that you can actually output the chart to the website, FTP the chart up, and we've got that running 24-7 as well. Um, but I'm still keen to actually build up something um, that, that uses some traditional Geiger tubes, uh, something that perhaps has a bit more sensitivity. Um, so that's on the cards to do as well. Then we've got our 21 centimetre receiver to detect neutral hydrogen. Uh, in the universe, the most abundant gas uh, in, the, in the universe at, um, at, at 14, 20 megahertz. Um, very easy to receive this, uh, this stuff as well. Um, there's a, a basic block diagram of, uh, of a receiver that's been suggested to make up and what we're, able, what we're interested to be able to do is to receive the whole hydrogen uh, at the rest frequency and then by scanning the dish around or the antenna around through the sky you can determine whether a, a, a part of the sky is receding or coming, coming towards you, the Doppler effect, in other words, um, by the amount of shift that we, we see in, in, the, um, in the reception of the hydrogen line. Um, and that way we can actually create radio maps of the sky at, uh, at using the hydrogen line frequency, rest frequency. So that's another project that we've got uh, planned to do as well. Uh, solar observations, what I'm hoping to do is have a, a receiver going, we haven't quite finished this one yet though, but a dedicated receiver tuned to 10.7 centimetre wavelength, which is the, the uh, frequency used by uh, the CSIRO to monitor the uh, solar flux. Um, if you go to spaceweather.com, a, 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 a every day there's a reading up there that gets updated to, uh, to give you an idea of solar flux, the solar flux units, and uh, it's at this frequency here that uh, they're doing their observations. So I, I want to actually set up a, a dedicated 1.5 2 metre dish that just tracks the sun uh, while it's up and uh, we have the output of that data going to our website as well to, uh, to, uh, to analyse the data as well. And then there's the Callisto project which is a very interesting project that's come online in just a few, uh, a few months. Um, there's the, it's a little kit that you can build up using a, a VHF UHF tuner and some clever uh, software and, and little package which it turns it into a spectrometer. So you can actually have it monitoring between 
in this particular chart, it's, it's, it's between 200 and 500 megs, but you can actually have it so that it's, because it's a TV tuner, um, you can actually have it so that it tunes between 45 megs and 860 megs. And what you're seeing there is a solar flare. That's uh, a CME, a coronal max ejection from, uh, from the sun, disturbing um, or being detected at these frequencies using a log periodic antenna. And we have, I have almost got that completed. Um, it, it actually took take another four hours for me to get that uh, job finished. And that, I'd have that being, all that data being outputted again to our website for easy viewing. At the moment, these countries here are participating in the project uh, for the e Callisto project. They're, they're running uh, various receivers uh, with a very similar log periodic antennas. Um, that's what it stands for, uh, Callisto. Um, no, no real intention for the name of uh, the, the moon um, of uh, Saturn, I think it is, one of the moons of Saturn. But um, it's just an acronym. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting that finally up and running so that we can actually study solar flares in using spectrometry, spectrometer to study the, the intensity uh, that we see at different wavelengths. Um, you can learn something from that too. Uh, then Meteor, we're just going to set up a basic Meteor receiver monitoring a distant station. The output of the receiver will again be uh, visible on the internet um, so we can actually monitor uh, the ionised trails left by meteors. Uh, and of course we're all familiar with that being ham radio operators. One of us from time to time have probably used um, the technique of Meteor scatter and whatnot. It's been, it hasn't been ages since I've done that. Um, so uh, I, I thought it'd be interesting just to have a, a simple receiver set up to, to monitor media activity. And there's some sound files there. Uh, let's hope they all fire up. Uh, and generally when we hear that on two meter sideband, we're all calling crazy on 144.1 to see if uh, we can get a into VK4 or something like that. But that's, that's what a, a media, in this case a linear media sounds like. And so that's, that's just simply a, a, a receiver looking at a distant transmitter you can't hear normally so far away. But as soon as the media leaves its ionized trail, the signal reflects off it and that's, that's generally what it sounds like. Um, and this is a, a, a radar echo off the, the space shuttle. Very short sure one. As it goes over. Now one of the other things we're going to muck around with, um, this is a, 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 a software defined radio and uh, we have this, um, uh, we'll be running with a log periodic antenna doing this pretty much the same thing. Um, it, this is what, <coughs> again, this is what a solar flare looks like when you're charging it on a chart recorder. Just suddenly the noise just, just goes for a, a massive increase and then just slowly decays uh, over time. But that, what that looks like using a spectrometer is, is this. And that, that's what that SDR receiver can produce, is this amazing graphic illustration of, of that solar flare and of course that's looking between th um, up as far as 30 megs down to about uh, 15, 18 megs in that, that whole spectrum. So you can look at the, that part of the spectrum all in one go and be able to see the structure of that solar flare graphically represented in, in, as in, in various intensity um, uh, intensities. <clears throat> Everything horizontal on that image is man-made interference or signals or noise. Um, but, but anything that takes up the entire spectrum like that for a, for a short moment is extraterrestrial for sure in, in origin. <clears throat> so with that SDR radio, um, I've got the antenna for it. I've got the receiver. I've just got to hook it all up and get it set up and I'll be out putting this image to the site as well for, for further analysis as well. Uh, that's what Jupiter looks like through the same receiver. Um, this is... Um, this is what I was telling you before, with those storm, Jupiter storm activities, they, they often start high up in the band and, and wafted down at, at, at megahertz per second rate. And that's what, from a, through a spectrometer, that's what those storm, Jupiter storm activities do look like. Uh, and it's a more intense storm up, actually up there. 
So I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to out, output this data up to the, the website as well. Um, for the for the optical astronomers, I thought this was just a simple little thing to, to use. This just as a little device that plugs into your to your router and outputs a, a, a graph like this, which uh, gives you an indication of sky quality. So since the ASV's dark sky site's mostly for optical purposes and, and studying the sky, I'll have the output of this device, which is just a little photosensitive uh, device that looks up at the sky at about a five degree angle, and it just measures the, the amount of light intensity being reflected back, uh, and it gives you an idea of the sky quality. There's a, a, a reference to, uh, um, to some graph numbers which you can determine how clean or how pure the sky is for seeing from an optical point of view. So since the, the website that we have up at Heathcote, the satellite feed's the only access to the internet, I figured, well, I'm not going to be using all of it for radio astronomy. Why not share it for the optical guys as well? So that's my thinking there as well. Uh, and now we come to our little seismograph device. Um, I just got this up and running just a short while ago, but that's kind of an illustration of what the, the graph looks like. And this one here, for instance, is a, a quake that occurred just a few... Um, when, when was that? Uh, <laughs> I think it's Mars. Yeah. <laughs> that's a mobile phone, I think. <laughs> I don't know read it. Um, a few, I think about, um, about two or three weeks ago there was an earthquake 2,000 kilometres away uh, and it was just, just off the, uh, the coast of Macquarie Island and that's what the sensor that I had sitting on, on the floor of the barn at home uh, was able to record um, this amazing device and if hopefully, I'm not going to stuff things up here, but it should be possible for me to uh, just go out of that for a sec. There we go. I'll see if I can speed that up. Okay, so that, you, this, this program actually allows you to record events and you can actually play them back. Um, so I'll just play that again. So that was an event that occurred about 2,000 kilometres away. And um, because... Oh, no, that's not real time, no. That's, that's actually sped up. But um, uh, generally, um, uh, quake uh, S waves travel um, uh, at about uh, anywhere between 1 to 8 kilometres per second through, uh, through the crust. And so that actually works out about a four-minute delay between where Macquarie Island is and where, I, where my sensor was at Narrow Warren. What about the couple of earthquakes we had uh, in the last month or so? Did you get that? Yes, we did. Um, <coughs> that one there, I was actually getting my fish and chips sitting in the car, and uh, a fellow on the local repeater said, oh, we're having an earthquake, and it was in Pakenham. And uh, <laughs> I said to him, Stu, quick, go and check the website out. This is actually looking at the website, because, again, this system allows you to FTP the image up. And he says to me, Clint, you're going to be impressed because this is what we're seeing. And, and I couldn't wait to get home with the fish and chips to have a look. And uh, so that, that, that occurred uh, 12 kilometres outside um, Maui just a few Friday nights ago. This, this is actually um, at uh, just 11 minutes past seven uh, last uh, about Friday, Friday night about a few weeks ago. So I, I thought that, that was um, about a four, I think, on the Richter scale. And that, that just goes to show how sensitive all this other noise here is just traffic going past uh, our property. So I'm hoping to relocate the seismometer up to, to Heathcote where it'll be a much quieter location. So not only are we going to be doing radio astronomy observations and experiments, but there's also geoscience activities going on as well, which I'm, I'm fascinated in doing. One of the other things we're also planning on doing uh, is monitoring uh, uh, telemetry, te telemetry from uh, probes uh, that are circling Mars and Venus and, and Mercury. Uh, they, they all fundamentally operate on around about 8.4 gigs and uh, I've got the necessary hardware which looks very similar to that uh, together to monitor. We're not going to be able to resolve pictures and data, it's not that, you know, not that great, but it's just the challenge of being able to, to actually detect the signals coming in from the various probes. Um, this mob here, um, Yahoo group, is a, is a dedicated group to, to actually monitoring the, these activities. And it's amazing the signals that they actually are able to see with a modest dish, um, size dish. And, and again, we're only looking at the carrier, not really going out to actually detect any, 
any signals, uh, you know, to decode pictures and, and data, which is not really possible without a, a much bigger, bigger dish and know-how. Uh, this is our horn. We've just recently finished building a 1.4 gig horn antenna for monitoring the hydrogen line. Um, that's uh, we've, before we painted it, but uh, we're going to be putting a, a monopole in there and uh, a down converter uh, to uh, probably the 400 meg band and uh, we'll be monitoring, um, doing some uh, rudimentary observations of the hydrogen line using that horn. Um, that's it now painted and again there. Uh, and basically we're going to be using it just as a demonstration unit to illustrate that, that the hydrogen line and hydrogen itself was, was detected initially by an instrument very similar to that um, many years ago. And uh, we're just going to show how, you know, as a demonstration, you know, how easy it is to be able to detect hydrogen line uh, or hydrogen in the, in the universe using a horn antenna of that, uh, that design. Uh, we're also after some dish antennas as well in, in the process over these last 15 years. Um, this, this antenna was being made surplus at the, at the Marsfield CSIRO place in Sydney uh, about 12 months or so ago. We put a tender in to try and get it, but unfortunately a combination uh, of universities got in ahead of us and, and took it instead. So we missed out on that by the slightest chance. I think you might recognise Alan Devlin there, VK3XPD. Um, Alan told me about this dish sitting up on top of an old Swinburne University up here somewhere. Um, it's been sitting there since uh, 1983, not used, uh, partly because of this brick wall that's gone up. It makes it pretty much useless for what they might have wanted to use for it. So it's just sitting up there, and it's, as far as Telstra is concerned, or it's not actually a Telstra building, um, it's, it's just not cost effective to remove it. So it's just sitting there at the moment, being wasted away. If uh, Alan was telling me if he could use it for his own work and you know what he's like with his moon bounce and stuff like that, he'd be quite happy to be able to utilise it. But he, he told me about it and he said, look, maybe ASV can get it uh, and, and get it relocated to Heathcote. Um, again, the problem is health and safety occupation really kills a lot of the, these sorts of projects. You go back 10 years ago and we could have probably removed that dish with a couple of guys over a few weekends. but. Being right at the top of a building, it just makes it very, very difficult and very expensive to get it done by using riggers. So it was one of those things we just had to let go, um, unless there's some, some way of getting it off that building cheaply. I'm interested. <laughs> um, Channel 9, GTV9 in Bendigo had a, a, a dish, 13.8 metre or 13 metre dish that was about to be cut up for scrap. We were told about that. Again, Alan was the one who informed me about it. We got in there and had some plenty of photographs taken to see how we could get this. It's actually sitting in the, the ground. It's um, <coughs> to, to try and minimise the, the impact to the local public. Um, they actually dug a fairly deep hole in the ground, so all the structure that's supporting that dish is below ground level. And because it's only monitoring Earth satellites, it didn't really have to move too far. But it, I mean, it was a, a 40 foot dish, and it was just we were so close to getting this, but again, it was it was ASV has got health and safety business and it's just all this gunge about you know who could be injured because it's not on ASV property and all this sort of stuff you know it makes it made it very hard and at the last moment we just had to say sorry we can't we can't get it it's just going to be too much hassle in in dismantling this dish uh, safely and getting it up to to Heathfield. there was even one fellow that suggested an, an army helicopter coming in and picking the damn thing up and flying it off uh, to, to Heathcote for us which might have been a possibility if we had have sold it from a point of view of a public PR stunt type thing, you know. But, but carrying, carrying this dish across suburbia might have been a bit of a, a thing, and yeah. <laughs> might have been, a, some people might have thought, sure, there's a flying saucer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so unfortunately we missed out on getting that too. But if anybody, honestly, if anybody knows where we can get a hold of a large dish antenna that's easy to get a hold of, um, would be interested because it's the one thing I really want to get going up at our Dark Sky site, apart from all these other projects, is to have a large dish antenna that we can do a, a multitude of experiments with. Uh, one of my interests is pulsar detection, to detect pulses. This, this would have done it. This would have been able to have, de to, to have detected the, some of the strongest of pulses that are available. So um, uh, we're still hoping to get a hold of a large dish. Even something like this, the old Kennedy dishes that Doug MacArthur's got, there was a, quite a few of these available um, many years ago. And they, fortunately, the people who are in the know 
managed to get them uh, for a song, you know, $400, I think they might have been tended up for. Um, uh, I just wasn't around at the time to be able to get one myself, but uh, yeah, something like that would be good, because apparently they're spec to 10 gigs, believe it or not. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's actually Doug's uh, uh, one up at, uh, up at Yay, or whatever he calls it, something in Central Victoria, yeah. Out of interest, this is a graph I did of black body radiation from the moon during a solar eclipse, a lunar eclipse. Um, it took me quite a few hours to do. I started at about 10 o'clock and uh, finished at about almost 3 o'clock. Um, but it was a lunar eclipse that uh, occurred back in 2000. And I had a, just a standard 1.5 metre dish with a, using a, a 14 gig LNA, TV LNA at the feed point. And I was using, uh, actually this was all done by hand. I, I just looked at a, a, a multi-meter voltage across the S-meter on the satellite receiver. And every five minutes I plotted the voltage as I re-peaked the dish on the moon. So this is um, a full luminosity. This is uh, when the eclipse was in, in total, totality and then back to full illumination again. So it just shows that this is a characteristic curve of black body radiation from the moon as the moon cools down and then reheats again. Um, and you actually see a very similar graph in Krauss's book, <coughs> which is considered the Bible for radio astronomy. Uh, that particular book, Radio Astronomy, second edition by John D. Krauss. Very techy stuff. That's, that's available on the DVD um, if you pick up a copy. Um, it was a very cold night there too. That's the main web page for, AS, for the ASV uh, website. Um, there's our, <coughs> a link to our, uh, our own web page the, for the radio astronomy. Le Leon Mao Dark Sky Radio Observatory, lmdsro.com is the actual website. Um, but you click on that link and you'll go straight there and get all that, all that wonderful data that we're slowly expanding on. But that's the main page, web page to, to ASV. Uh, this is our meetings that, that occur on a monthly basis, for the third Monday of every month at Parra Street, Burwood. Uh, here we've got Alan giving us a, a talk about his 10 gig EME stuff that occurs, uh, that he did. And uh, every Friday night, uh, which would be about now I guess, I'd be doing a, a transmission on 80 metres, 3541 kilohertz, where I, I, it's like a little broadcast thing I do. We get a, a few stations in, probably about uh, six or seven stations calling around Victoria, sometimes around Australia, and, um, and I, I just go into it. I, I call them all in for the first five minutes. We have a bit of a waffle, and, uh, and then I just go into like a little news session where I read out uh, articles in the latest Sky and Telescope or let people know what's happening with ASV, events occurring, what's happening with the radio astronomy side of it. Um, so that's just a, something that I've only just got back into this because I've got the station set up at home. Uh, but this has been going for 20 years, this little net on a Friday night. It's been running for about 20 years by um, uh, Russell Ward, VK3DRW. Um, uh, but Russell decided to go on holiday a, a, a short while ago and he asked me to take over for a little bit, so I've been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, if you want to learn more about Jupiter, what's involved with Radio Jupiter and how to listen to these storms, there's a couple of books that are available, although actually they're not no, no more. <laughs> um, that was the first edition by Richard Flagg. He came out with the sec second edition with an extra couple of chapters available. Both those books are available on the DVD that I've got. I've scanned them in PDF file. So um, they, they, they absolutely are a brilliant publication that tells you about what's going on with Jupiter and how to, 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 to uh, tune into all the, the activity that's going on. Um, you might have seen this book. This is a WIA's made this available through their bookshop. Um, that'll give you a, an interesting introduction into uh, radio astronomy, particularly amateur radio astronomy from that point of view. Um, a couple of other books that are available via the website where you can download the Radio Scope Sky Pope chart program. Uh, and, uh, and thanks for that's listening. But before I go any further, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so these are the discs. Uh, unfortunately, there's only 20 of them, but if anybody does want a copy, um, I can easily burn and, or make a copy available to to uh, the, uh, the club, and uh, you can get a, get, get a copy. Um, but in a sense, with what we're doing up here at, at Heathcote is, is amateur astronomy, radio astronomy, but if we can get a hold of a, a large dish antenna, uh, we can do so much more. With this shipping container that we're getting up and, and running with the, uh, the RF screen room environment and shielding and all this sort of thing, we hope that once it gets finally up and running, we might be able to approach Monash University and Swinburne and say, hey, look, we've got a facility up here. 
If you, you've got graduate students that are studying radio astronomy, if they want to run a project up there, we've got a facility for them to use as well. So, and of course, with our, uh, our section, the radio astronomy section, um, we have about probably about 10, 15 members that make up the section. They're building various projects which are all going to be included up there one way or another. So we're, I'm, ha I'm happy to go out and build a kit like this that's already been designed by somebody and all the hard work's been done. Um, we do have a, a, a members of the section that are actually designing their own receivers and in fact there's a receiver that, that's being designed that will have full control through the internet so that we can actually calibrate it remotely and, uh, and change frequency remotely because at the moment this receiver it only allows you about 150 kilohertz tuning and at the moment the receiver up at uh, Heathcote is sitting at the 12 o'clock position and uh, we do suffer from interference from time to time and I just wish I could reach through the, the internet and go out and t change that frequency a little bit but we're, we're looking into that. What's the time delay between uh, uh, Jupiter and uh, the Earth? Uh, you're looking probably about nine to ten minutes or so. Be about that. Um, the prediction program takes care of all that because with the it, when it when uh, uh, it runs, you you actually it, it'll give you a, the time in GMT and local, so you'll know exactly reference to worth you know where we are here exactly when to listen for. Uh, okay, so that's that's basically about it. Oh. Do we know what's actually going on on, on the surface of uh, Jupiter? Well, interestingly enough, they've actually bounced radar signals off Jupiter and not a whole lot returns. Um, so, <laughs> it's, uh, if, you, if you were to look at a radar image of Jupiter, it's a very cold and dark looking object. Um, but they reckon that there is a molten core there, not iron, but of, of some sort of liquid hydrogen sort of molten type core. And that's the dynamo that generates these in, intense uh, magnetic fields and toruses that that uh, uh, create these amazing s storm and activities. So in fact, it is magnetic fields. Yeah. And the intersection of magnetic fields yes. sort of creating the yes. outburst. Yep. And that that field of influence actually extends for many thousands and thousands of kilometres uh, away out of Earth. I mean. It, the sun, Jupiter is just like, if it had been big enough, had enough mass, it could have turned into a, a sun. It just wasn't big enough. But uh, it's, uh, it's doing some very, very fascinating things at that planet. And the fact that we can just simply tune into it with a simple receiver. I know we're all ham radio operators, if, and we, all have, we are able to tune into 15 megs. Uh, sorry, 21 megs. So the reason why we choose 21 megs is just because the atmosphere is, is, is clear to allowing these signals to come in during the day and night. And, um, uh, and it's also relatively quieter than, because apparently these decametric emissions from Jupiter can extend down as far as 8 megahertz, but the atmosphere, of course, the ionosphere won't allow that to, those signals to pass. But as you go higher in the shortwave band, you know, 18 megs, 20 megs up, you, you can actually, signal actually will penetrate through. And your receiver, what, um, what are IF and the that you use in the receiver? For the Jupiter receiver here? Um, well, it's a direct conversion, so oh, okay. yeah, it's it, basically we're just having the audio output. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's just the, we just <laughs> run it straight into the laptop sound and, and it works that way. Question: The dish you're looking for, what size would you class as? Uh, Anything bigger than five meters. <laughs> Yeah, um, preferably 10 metres, you know, even up to 13 metres. You know, the, the, um, some of the optical astronomers up there are a bit worried about having a big dish up there because it might affect their viewing, but I've, I've kind of already gauged that. And there's, a, there's two field, ob observation fields, and one field's for the guys who've got doing photography. And, and from their point of view, uh, a big 40 foot dish in, in where we are is, is there's trees literally behind it so it's it's just not going to affect anything visually um, but yeah I'm really looking forward to getting hold of a, a large dish so that, that it would be a, a project that we could all get involved with for uh, for a couple of years and, and just building it up in fact we've been thinking about making it our own you know pre-stressed pre parabolic dish and, and doing it ourselves you know that, that's something along those lines but um, you know, being able, there are various techniques to being able to receive pulses um, using um, uh, software and, and what they call binning and uh, overlapping data and, uh, and accumulating data and, and eventually seeing something amongst the chaos, you know, the, the noise. 
Um, but they, they, I'm, what I'm wanting to do, and a, and a 40 foot dish would do it, is to, to track a, a, a well known pulsar and, and have on, on an open day where we well, our star barbecue, we have visitors coming through because it's amazing when we have our star barbecue, the, the 200 people that roll up to our dark sky site, they all want to come over and have a look at what we're doing. And it's, it's just a full on fest, you know, with just chatter, chatter, chatter. But I'd love to be able to say, and right now, our 40 foot dish out here is tracking such and such pulsar. And this is what it sounds like, you know, <laughs> turn up the volume and you actually hear it going, shh, 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 shh. you know, that'd be, that'd just make my day to be able to do that. Um, so the, the property up there is about 33 hectares in size, even though it's kind of already been, most of it's been put aside for optical purposes, um, there is kind of the land space to be able to run a, a array antennas that are, that are just at ground level, but all pointing up. And if we all hook them together to make a larger antenna, it may be possible to detect the strongest pulse using that arrangement. So um, we're working on it, we're getting there. Um, and I suspect that uh, this, this shipping container that we're working on is, is going to, to we're, we're actually planning on building a roof over it to try and reduce the direct heat and all that sort of stuff too. Yes? How much land do you got up at least? How much? Land. For about 33 hectares. So, uh, We've got some room to play with. We're, we're actually thinking about buying the property next door too that's, that's been considered at the moment. I don't know we'll be getting it though. Do you know about Andrew's uh, chirp radar? Uh, Andrew's? Yeah, 308. No. Weeds of heat kit. Oh, I, there is an interfering signal that we do get from time to time. We'd love to that. Okay. He's doing, atmosp he's doing atmospheric studies for Using yeah. chirp radar and these remote stations in Heathkit. Well, isn't it a receiving station in Heathkit, isn't it? Sorry? No, not a receiving station in Heathkit, isn't it? So you transmits from up here. It transmits from 33 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this, this actually swoops. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't it? Yeah, right. oh, we're hearing that all the time. <laughs> 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 but the thing is, it only passes, it passes through the, the IF of the, the, this receiver so quickly yeah, yeah. that it just that's sounds that's like that's a. Andrew. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, that's not too much of a bother. In fact, the CSIRO have got, the, you know, part of their ionospheric prediction services, a very similar thing. Yeah. And we've, we've all heard that uh, swooping up the van all the time. So you've got to live with that sort of thing. Yeah. Providing you know what the interference is, then you can separate that and then listen for the real interesting stuff coming in from... Some of the stuff, some of the data you've got on there, he's actually got it inside as well. So ah, okay. He's doing atmospheric study, so maybe you should go and talk to him. Not a problem. Well, I mean, Pugapungil's just over the back there. We often wonder if the army base uh, is also got something going on as well from time to time. Um, but we've had some uh, RITI interfering us with us lately, and that causes the, the FTP charts that come up to the website are just full on with, uh, you can just see it, it's just full on interference. And if you click on the sound, the audio stream link that I've got to the receiver, you, you hear that it's RITI, and you think, bugger me, if there was only a way. So just change that frequency just to, to, to get off it, you know. But um, now radio astronomy is interesting stuff. It's, uh, it's something that's all within our reach. We've all got ham radio receivers. It's a, it's a good idea if, you can, if your receiver has an AGC off function because the AGC of a receiver can affect the ultimate signals being received. If you can turn your AGC off, that's the better because then it's not affected. Um, um, but if you're ever interested in radio astronomy, certainly start by trying to listen to, to Jupiter um, with your, your receivers at, at, at 21 megs. You've got the themes and, um, and uh, just, just download the, the prediction program so you've got a bit of an idea of when to listen to and, uh, and away you go. And it's, like I say, it makes perfect solar flare receiver. Um, it's just an introduction into to radio, amateur radio astronomy. It's quite, quite good. Any other questions? I'm really glad you guys turned up tonight. It's quite, quite, quite good. I don't, it's five to ten. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you. Did, uh, did Lockie ever develop his side up at, uh, up at Yard? Didn't Lockie have the side at Yard? There was a fellow, yeah, Rod Letts. Oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, um, he's, not, he, he's not very well at the moment, so he's selling off a lot of his stuff, and I, I think he really wants to well and truly retire. Um, he put himself quite a nice... Uh, Set up he did. He does, and I know. I know he's. Yeah, you you might have noticed on VK Ham that he's been selling some equipment lately too. So he's really kind of getting out of it one way or another. I, I think he really wants to try and get his property finally done up there. Um, 
Uh, we haven't seen Rod for a while, actually. He used to frequent the meetings many years ago, but uh, yeah, we haven't seen him for a while. Okay, they're uh, complete. I'd like to really put their hands together and give one. Uh, Thank you. Put up in your new barn shack, is it? Barn yep, shack. Your barn shack. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming tonight. And no worries, Jack. Certainly appreciate it. Wonderful talk. And before you disappear, Damien is going to come over and um, bring the raffle bucket over. So. Well, oh, Carl, what, what did you think of that presentation? I thought it was excellent, Jack. Did you, did, was it above your head, or was it? It was, but it's inspired me to learn and do more. Yeah. And I've got a copy of that disc. So, oh, you've got one. Yeah, yeah, I got okay. one. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was, it was very good, yeah. No, it was. Yeah. yeah. But it was a pleasure to have him here, he was a good speaker. Yep. So yep. it's all about what, what did you think of the, the presentation? It was, wasn't it? Is it, is it an area you're interested in, or is it uh, particularly, but uh, nevertheless, very Yeah, yeah, I must admit I did. It is an area I'm interested in. So. And I knew very little about it. You knew very little about radio astronomy. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I did before tonight. I know a little bit more now. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thanks. Is this a